Okay, so vapor pressure. And so I mentioned in class that you can tell when things have a high vapor pressure because they're going to stink. Um, that's true, like acetone has a very distinct smell. Gasoline also has a really distinct smell. Even things that are good smelling like perfume or baking bread, they have high vapor pressures. That's why you smell them. All right, so let's take a look at my animations here. Uh, you can see these yourself um, if you want to by clicking on the lecture notes and um, in Google and setting up in presentation mode. All right, so here's what's happening with the, just the solvent water. So we have the liquid phase where everything is relatively close together. That's because water has pretty high IMF, hydrogen bonds, two of them, um, which are strong. But even still, some small portion of the atoms, and this varies by temperature too, but some portion of the uh, molecules have enough energy to escape into the gas phase. They're the rebels. Eventually though, uh, after bouncing around in the container a little bit, they are gonna fall back into the solution. So this is another example of an equilibrium. So we can write this equilibrium um, just as just as we did with the solid today, but it's not a solid, it's a liquid. Um, and it's at equilibrium with its gas phase. It's not changing anything chemically. This is a physical change. All of these are physical properties. So it's still water. It's just, you know, water vapor or um, water liquid. <laughs> we usually call water vapor steam. Um, so anyway, that's what's happening there. If I put salt into it, you can see the big ions. I want you to know, um, I want you to recall the difference between, what is going on with my pen? There. The difference between size here. So Na and Cl, um, when you give up an electron, which one is bigger? The one that gives up or the one that gains the electron? Okay, that'll be another quiz question for you in Blackboard. Um, so anyway, I'm trying not to spoil it. I don't wanna give it away. Whichever one is chlorine and whichever one is sodium, they are attracted to the water and the water is, is interacting with them as well. That's what IMF are. So this would be an example of an ion dipole interaction, which is really strong. So that is going to mean there are literally less gas molecules, less particles have enough energy to escape from this very strong interaction in the liquid. That's why the vapor pressure is lower. Okay. This is an example um, when we have a non-volatile solute. In other words, the solute does not evaporate. You don't see any sodium or chlorine up here. We can also have mixtures where the solute is volatile as well. So krypton and xenon are both very, very, very low freezing points, um, very close to zero Kelvin, which means they're both volatile. So you're gonna end up with a mixture. And you'll remember from the gas laws that Dalton's law allows us to add up the pressure of, of a each pressure of the components in a mixture to figure out the total. So like for here, this example would be the total pressure, which is sometimes called barometric pressure if it's equal to the room pressure you measure that with a barometer, it's gonna be equal to the krypton plus the pressure of the xenon, okay? Um, each of those is related by what fraction of the total? Okay, so remember that this is not x, these are chi's, this is a chi, chi, chi. So chi is mole fraction. So when we're talking about krypton, the mole fraction of krypton is going to be the number of moles of krypton in the mixture divided by total moles. And similarly, of course, moles of um, the chi of xenon is gonna be moles of xenon divided by the same total, right? The same thing applies up here when you're talking about the solvent, right? So chi of this subscript means the chi of the solvent. So we're gonna go moles of solvent divided by total. 
Okay, so the reason that this one is about just the solvent is because that's the only one that's volatile. Okay, you're not going to get any solute in, in the gas, so it's not going to have a pressure. Down here, um, you have to consider both of them, all right? And these, these two ratios are probably going to be related to each other because, of course, Kr plus Zexe is going to equal the total, right? Okay. So at any rate, but you can have mixtures with however many components you want and, and still use this, this set of formulas, okay? So, um, there's a formula for this. Hold on, let me pull it up for you. Okay, so when we're choosing which of these formulas to apply, it's definitely vapor pressure, so it's probably one of the two. There are other equations, but these are the primary ones. Um, we have to decide, is our solute volatile or not? So in this case, oops, wrong way, sorry. In this case, our solute sounds like it's some sugar. So sugar is a covalent molecule. It's carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. Um, so it does not ionize in water. Um, and let me show you a photograph of the structure so you can decide what you think the IMF is going to be. Okay, so here's the modeling kit that you might have used in high school or even in, in our gen chem class. So sucrose is the name of table sugar. There's lots of sugars, but when people say sugar, they're probably referring to sucrose. And you can see carbon bonds everywhere, carbon oxygen bonds, carbon hydrogen bonds, oxygen hydrogen, there's a lot of those everywhere, okay? Um, so this is another way of re representing the same thing where each corner that does not have a specific, so this has oxygen on it, but these don't, those are carbons. Okay, so these are organic structures. So if you're going on to organic chemistry, it's a good thing to be exposed to those now. But it's basically showing you the same thing as this model does. And so on the outside, you see all of these OH bonds. These are not bases, they are alcohol groups. So sugars are called, sometimes called sugar alcohols. So at any rate, you have, they don't get you drunk though. So you have all these OHs. So I want you to tell me what kind of IMF this is going to have when it mixes with water. Okay, so I want you to attempt this problem. There's a bit of um, work that has to get done with it, but we have um, hopefully identified the IMF that, that the water is going to have with, so... Um, and so if that's a strong enough interaction, then we have to assume the sugar is not volatile. And you kind of know that also because, you know, sugar doesn't have a smell really. It has a flavor, but it does not have a smell. Um, I'm imagining you all going to sniff sugar and see if I'm right. I don't know. Maybe you'll smell something. It's certainly not a strong scent. So we are going to treat it as a non-volatile solution a non-volatile solute at any rate. So that means we're gonna to choose to use the first equation here. So then you have to choose the right value for I, keeping in mind that sugar is covalent, and you have to figure out the mole fraction of the solvent, so that's the numerator, and the total moles goes on the bottom. And then you're gonna to have to find the pressure of the solvent by itself, okay? Now, um, it's important to notice that your units of pressure don't match here. So you're gonna have to convert something. It's your choice which one, but atmospheres and tor are two different things, right? And so we want our pressure to go down by 0 0.004 atmospheres, but we can't subtract that from 740 tor, so you're gonna to have to convert one of them. Okay, so try this out and we'll see how it goes on Blackboard. Okay, our last formula for this chapter is about osmotic pressure. So we already talked about osmotic pressure and the terminology that goes with it. That's really, really important to know for those of you who are in um, health-centered fields. ISO, hyper, and hypo are terms that are going to come up everywhere. I can't emphasize that enough. Those are, those are Latin prefixes that happen a lot. Um, so 
it's good to know, but it's also important in this particular context where we're talking about tonicity. There is something wrong with this equation, and I'm just going to tell you um, because I don't want you to mess this up. This also has an I value in it. So it's not just, so osmotic pressure is capital Pi, and it should be the Van Hoff factor times molarity, so that's moles per liter, N is moles, right? Just like the ideal gas law, times R times T. Okay, so, so I want you to write down what you think a reasonable pressure is that would be in atmospheres for blood cells. So what do you think? Just guess, it doesn't matter. I'm just curious what your sense of scale is for um, pressures. It's not related to blood pressure, by the way. That's the force that blood travels through your circulatory system. It's a different thing. Um, this is osmotic pressure. This is measured in atmospheres. So just take a guess. How many atmospheres do you think it is? We're going to solve it, but I'm curious what you think. You can't be right or wrong about that one. I mean, you can be, but it doesn't matter. All right, so this problem is asking, based on the concentration of an IV bag, this is real, by the way, if you've ever been rehydrated in a hospital or whatever, 0.9% mass per volume is what it says right on the IV bag. It's isotonic with our blood, right? So remember that means that the concentration is equal to our blood cells. Um, not all the salt in our body is NaCl, but they're using NaCl because it's the most common. So we can use that information. And so we'll con first convert it. So it's mass per volume, so grams per 100 milliliters. Those are our units, or kilograms and liters. Either one works. Um, I figure it's probably a smaller volume, so I'm going to choose grams and milliliters, but it doesn't matter. Um, we want to get to osmotic pressure. So of course, R is easy. That's our friend from the ideal gas law, which is why osmotic pressure in this case um, is measured in atmospheres. T is, well, I guess it depends on your assumption. If you're assuming room temperature, then it would be 20 degrees Celsius. Remember that this is a gas law problem in disguise, so it has to be in Kelvin, though. Um, or maybe, I mean, this is going to go into a patient, ideally. That's what it's for. So maybe it's body temperature. Do you know what body temperature is in Celsius? As long as you don't have a fever, it's 37 degrees. So same thing there. We want to make sure we convert it into Kelvin. That ends up being 310 Kelvin, I think. Yep, I checked it. Good. So um, whichever temperature you think is reasonable for the question, it doesn't specify. So you could ch choose whatever you want as long as you explain it. Um, I'm just going to pick room temperature. Maybe it's not ready for a patient yet. So we have R, we have T. Uh, we have a volume, but the unit's wrong, right? So I need to, I need to first convert that volume into liters. Easy peasy, I hope. Um, sig figs are kind of a mystery here because it's just a percentage. It's only got one, so... We won't be too strict with them this time. And then, of course, we need moles, right? So that's moles of solute to be specific. So to get that, we're going to have to use molar mass. So we're going to end up with 0 0.0154. And that's moles of salt. And then our Van Hoff factor, that comes from the fact that it's NaCl. So remember, anything ionic is going to ionize. And so you're going to get more than one particle. Here we get two. 
By the way, ionic and electrolyte mean the same thing. Sometimes your book uses those interchangeably. So if something says non-electrolyte, it means covalent bond. If it says it's an electrolyte, it's an ionic bond. So um, anyway, so we're gonna go, the pressure is two times the molarity, which ends up being 0 0.0154 moles over 0 0.1 uh, liters times our ideal gas constant. times whatever temperature you feel like. So the osmotic pressure of the, of the IV bag, you know what, I feel like maybe I'll change this. Maybe I do want to use the body because it's really asking us for the osmotic pressure of the blood. And so that would be body temperature, I suppose. I don't care. Justify your assumptions. That's the, that's the main, main idea there. So we end up with 7.84. And of course, our units, let's check them out. So liters cancels, moles cancel, kilograms cancel, not kilograms. Kelvin. Kelvin cancels. And so we're left with atmospheres. So our answer is going to be 7.84 atmospheres. Was that close to your guess? I think it sounds really high. So um, just to give a sense of scale, your car tires are two atmospheres or so. Um, you have to pump quite a bit of air in there to make them that high and it leaks out constantly, right? So salt is capable of, of creating quite a lot of osmotic pressure. Um, this is why people get the bends when they go deep in water, okay? So the pressure is very, very deep in there and your cells can't fight it and you end up with nitrogen bubbles and it's bad. That's a diving thing if you've never been diving. All right, so that's all of the kinds of calculations you're going to have in this in this section of the book. Um, they're not too bad. You just have to decide which which one to use and know which constants you have. Um, other applications of uh, osmotic pressure it include finding the molar mass of like really large things like proteins, viruses, which aren't that large, but you can find the size of it based on these things. All right. Um, this is a nice video to watch on how to do that. It's a really interesting application. All right, the last part of, of chapter 13 is about colloids, and we are going to come in to contact with them, most likely in chapter 10 in the lab. Well, actually, you've come in contact with, with them before. Um, yeah, soap is a colloid. Okay, um, mayonnaise is a colloid. Okay, so mayonnaise is made out of basically oil, egg, and air. And so it's a colloid because you have two different phases. You have liquid, oil, and egg, and you have air, which is a gas. So colloids are basically two different phases mixed together, and they look homogenous, but they're not really. So if you imagine zooming in on the particle level into mayonnaise, you're going to see air pockets, and you're going to see oil pockets, and like that. So that's what makes them a colloid. When you find them in the lab, they're really, really hard to separate, and it takes a little bit of reading in the notes to find out what you can add to help flocculate them. That means collect the solid into solid particles, all right? So there are chemicals that will help with that depending on the, on the colloid that you have. But if you have centrifuged something and it's still opaque and you can't get the solid down, that's a colloid. All right, here's some more practice. These are good ones to practice with. If you get answers and submit them, you can earn some points for module one.